Hi, and welcome back. We're in Lecture 4E, where we're going to start putting all the stuff together that we talked about in the Lecture 3 and Lecture 4 series. And we're going to look at actually how do we use all this information, the central limit theorem, probability basics, the distributions we talked about, the combinations, permutations, all the stuff that we've all had together, and actually use them for some practical purposes that we're going to do in design of experimentation. And in order to do that, we need to really talk again about that Dowsian distribution, also known as the normal distribution, and then actually do some examples of those hypothesis tests that we started to allude to the last couple of lectures. Let's go ahead and get started. So we're going to do the Gaussian distribution hypothesis testing. And we're going to look at that normal distribution again. Well, first of all, the second most frightening amount ever to most people taking math is Mount Doom. right? And I say that that's the second most frightening mountain because I've seen many, many students over my years and they hate the most frightening amount ever is the Gaussian distribution. That's even more frightening than Mount Doom to many people. So a lot of the times we see this, the idea is that we have a Gaussian distribution. This is a probability distribution. It's a probability density function. The area under here is one, just like before. And the idea is that if we have non-systemic variable variants, variants, or we have a uh, accumulation of random events or central limit theorems all use these concept of the Gaussian right and we actually have two scales that we're going to talk about and this is where it gets a little confusing so we have the X scale which I call the measurement scale and this is kind of like the reality and then we have the Z scale. And really, this is just a scaled version of the curve in such that we have a mu of zero and a standard deviation of one, right? That's what the Z scale is. It's just a scaled version of our other one. So depending on if you want to stay in measurement units, which a lot of engineers like to do, or you want to work in the Z domain, it's up to you. Right, and remember we have our little handy dandy conversion factor. We got our z domain is equal to our x minus that x bar over s. So we can convert those two domains. But in the essence, it's just a transformation. The idea is for the normal distribution, if everything's going well, within the first two standard deviations, we're looking at about 68% of the data is inside there. Likewise, we've got 95.45 within two standard deviations, and we have three, four, five, and then when we get into those concepts later in the lectures, we have six sigma, and we're going to talk more about that, and what we talk about is all the way out to six, sigma, six standard deviations away. And we actually see that, eh, a little bit different than actually six, but we'll talk about that when we get to those topics. We're not going to worry about that right now. But the idea to realize here is that in all these problems, we can either work in the measurement domain or we can work in the Z domain, depending on what you're most comfortable with. We'll see how that goes a little bit later. So the big idea is that we typically have this curve inside. Remember our, our alpha from last time, right? Our type one error rate, right? So what we want to do is set up these regions. This is my null hypothesis acceptance region. And this is my alternative hypothesis acceptance region. And if you're a stickler for this stuff, this is the high reject region. That's for those people who are just kind of being that way. Right, so you can either look at an hypothesis terms or acceptance region. Right, and so we look at this, and this is based, even if it was right, you're going to get data points, right? We did this from, we saw from our binomial and our normal distributions that we could get values out here for no reason right it's just going to happen even if this was the reality if this mu was actually true and even so if the mu is actually true i'm going to have some samples that i just happen to get really unlucky and grab some stuff that's way out here right so it's just going to happen even though mu is actually true it's just going to happen if I get one of those, I'm going to have, whoa, I got the real amazing data. I got the stuff that I got a whole bunch of them that were really big. 
or I got a whole bunch of them that were really high. I just happened to be really, really unlucky. And so I got data that was so crazy, it just didn't sound like Mew was right. But in reality, Mew really was. So I'm going to have that possibility of actually making that mistake. And so we're going to set that alpha to decide how many times I really want to be able to have that possibility of making that mistake. And then the idea is taking this exact same idea is we have this new phi concept. And phi is equal to the area under the curve. between its ranges, right? And so how we typically interpret this kind of idea, so this is interpreted as the area under the curve between A and B if centered on X bar with a standard deviation of s. And we write that as phi of a to x bar to b based on a, a centered on a value mu based on a standard deviation of x bars right so that's how we typically write that and you'll notice we can move this around we can also talk about what it is so what we call a and what we call b right a lot of the times we may call a is mu minus r z alpha over two times our standard error right these are our confidence intervals from before All right so you'll see that this is just kind of manipulated around and anytime you see these two values be zero and one that means you're talking about the normal curve, the normal Z curve of mu zero and standard deviation of one. All right, so it was just modified. And so when you don't see it out the, out the end, you don't see anything behind the commas, it's basically implied. So if it doesn't talk about it, then it's implied that it's zero and one rather than what it might actually be. All right, so we'll see how this kind of plays in the part in a little bit. So we're going to do some applications now. So, so far we looked at ways of describing data for the most part, which is good for communication data, but there's another, another which more useful was an engineer and this is inference. So we're taking a sample of data and we're using methods to infer properties. We talked about this in one of the other lectures. We have this population out here and it has a mu of some number and it has a standard deviation of something else, but you really don't know what it is. So what you're going to do is you're going to go ahead and take a sample and then I'm going to calculate an X bar and an S for the sample and I'm going to use inference. I'm going to use X and S to infer what mu might be. Yeah, you can sometimes do it with sigma, but usually this is the most important. Is we use the data we have, so we use my data to infer my reality. That's what we're basically doing. And a few assumptions are in order. The key ones that should be representative sample, we talked about during the sampling aspect, and it needs to be a random one. I can't just go ahead and take a bunch of little outliers you know, over in this one little corner, or I can't just pick and choose the highest ones. I have to actually randomly select this stuff, right? And if I don't follow those rules, then I'm slowly not beginning there because I'm not really following the rules and I won't necessarily have to deal with the fact that it might not be normally distributed. So using some of the other concepts we've referred, we're going to give this as a process to perform statistical inference. The general process is valid for most of the engineering applications we encounter. The difference is usually based on what test is what test is applicable that's the big one and what sample data we have available that pretty much tells us what test to run and we're going to learn a few other tests that are called non-parametric tests but we're going to find those out in a few weeks that's not part of this topic this is just this one 
So the hypothesis process is typically you calculate the statistics. This is from your data. Then you construct the hypothesis. You make your nulls and your alternatives. You establish how much risk. Risk are you willing to bear of being wrong? Typically of type one error or type two error, sorry, the alpha kind. We're gonna establish, based on that, we're gonna establish which test and what's our test statistic. Then we're gonna decide what values will change our mind. And we're gonna do this ahead of time. We'll talk about a little bit why. Then we actually calculate that test statistic based on the sample data then we make our decision based on our criteria, and then we report the conclusions. That's the typical process that we're going to follow for all of our hypothesis tests in this class. Let's try some examples. So the first one, we have nine corroded iron plates taken from a saltwater bath. They have an average corrosion layer thickness of 78.2 micrometers. We assume the population standard deviation is 6.2. So let's write down what we've got here. We're assuming that one, so we're going to assume that sigma is 6.2. If you want to make no worse error than one out of 100, oh, that sounds familiar, so I want to make an alpha of 0 0.01. That's the biggest mistake I want to make. Is there evidence to indicate that the overall population of corrosion layer thickness is greater than mu, uh, 80 mu is m? So I want to know, is the actual population greater than 80 micrometers? That's what I want to find out. So I probably want to strike out the opposite. Now their alternative is that the, the population is less than or it's equal to 80 micrometers. And I want to try to disprove this. That's my goal. Ooh, now I got some, some stuff I'm going to go Oh, and I also have in my sample size is 9. I put my 9. So let's highlight where we got all that information. So I got nine corroded plates. That's where I got my N9 from. I've got a mu of 6.2. Oh, I also have another one. I have an X bar of 78.2 micrometers. So I got a average corrosion layer. That's my reality. I have an alpha. I want to make no worse error than that. So that's where I get my alpha from. Then I have my possible hypothesis information is coming from this idea. That's where I get this one, which infers that I have an alternative of that one. All right, so let's take a look at what we're going to have. So that's how we're going to take that data. And let's go ahead and put it over here. So I go through my steps. I calculate my, my sample descriptive statistics. So that's where I've got those information from. And then the next thing I need to find out is construct the hypothesis. First, I have to ask myself, do I have one mean here or am I looking at two means? I only really have one thing. I'm comparing basically this, the values I got to a given mean. So I'm really only looking at one mean. One tailor two. What I'm really asking for is, am I asking, am I looking for an equals versus a not equals? Or am I looking for a greater than versus a less than equal to? Or less than versus greater than equal to? These are typically one-tail tests. These are typically considered two-tail tests. Right? If I matter which, er which way I make the mistake. So one. So the boring result, oh, there's HO, is that the mean of the population is 80, is, is 80 or less. Forgot to add that little bit. So there's that part. The amazing result is that it's actually above 80. That sets up our hypotheses. Then we establish a significant level. We want a one out of 100 chances. Again, we said that that's an alpha 0 0.01. P-value or alpha, you're gonna hear of this all the time. You're gonna talk here about P-values all the time and P-value hacking. We'll talk a little bit about that idea later. Um, what we're really doing here is that we, what we're doing is it doesn't really matter, just pick one. But you gotta set it ahead of time. So with alpha method, you set the decision interval first. So you set the goalposts. You say, here's the goalpost. This is my one minus alpha range. This is my alpha over two on this side, my alpha over two on this side. Set the range. If it's in here, I'm, I'm good. 
I, ex I go ahead and continue to accept my null hypothesis. If it pops out here, I reject that null or in engineering speak, I just go ahead and go with the alternative hypothesis for based on my data. Based on my data. Let's clean that up, make that look a little nicer. Go with, all right, we're gonna use engineering speak. In the P value, you kind of do it a little different. Basically you say, what, so this is kind of like, what would be the alpha I need to make the data rejected. And to me, this is kind of cheating. It's kind of like saying, well, how big would the goalposts need to be in order for that last kick to be counted as a go as a goal? Right, it's where A, you basically say, here's the hockey net. If you get the puck in here, you win. Puck out here, bad. This method, you go, here's the puck. Where does the goal, how wide does this goal post need to be so that I can score? All right, to me, it's kind of cheating. It does give you a little bit of information. There's a, one way you might want to use that. I don't like that method very often. I sometimes like to use this method, but there is some ideas we're going to talk about when we get to regression where we might want to understand things this way. But they are basically interchangeable. It's just which way you do it. The biggest thing here is that you've got to set it first. You cannot cheat. If you do it after you calculate, you decide where your goalposts are, that's not fair. That's kind of like cheating and saying, here, I'm going to shoot a puck. Then I'm going to decide whether or not it was a goal, right? We don't do that. If you cheat, you go to statistics hell. And statistics hell is this crazy place overseen by an overweight Justin Bieber singing Miley Cyrus songs on a continual loop. You don't want to go there. Trust me on that one. So then we're taking that. We're going to determine our applicable test and test statistics. Again, it's a one mean test. If we do know the population standard deviation. We don't have enough data points. We only have a 30 sample. So we're not going to use... Um, while the 30 would lead you to a T-score, we know the population standard, not common, so which overrides the need for use the student's T. We talked a little about that distribution. So we're going to stick with the Z distribution. And so I got my, te my test. My test is a one means means test. We're going to test the X bar. So I'm going to use a Z statistic. My Z statistic is going to be calculated by saying, I'm going to take the mean, I'm going to minus, minus the, the alternative hypothesis, the null hypothesis mean range. I'm going to look at the population, assume population, a standard deviation, and based on my number of data points. I'm going to calculate my T, a Z, and then I'm going to use my Z to make some decisions. Establish the criteria. So using the measurements method, so which I'm only going to talk about in X bars, I say the area under the curve from infinity to X bar up through the null hypothesis plus my standard error. And remember we have ignorance, right? Remember our old thing about this is ignorance. and risk. So I use those two to figure out what those are going to be. That's one over minus alpha. So I now I have, so you can see where this is all coming from. So we've got the infinity because I don't care all the way up to my final range plus a little bit more over. This is because of the confidence interval idea based on that particular setting. And I can recalculate this and basically says I want to have an X bar that's between negative infinity to 84.82 in order to go ahead and stay. So what this is really saying is I need, I need to see an X bar at least 84.82 before I'm willing to give up on the null hypothesis. 
right? So I have to, so if I get 83, eh, I got a little bit bigger, but it's not big enough. If I get 85 or 84.83, that's big enough to give me the sense that, nah, I don't think that 80 is really there. I think it's actually a little higher. The other way to do it is to use standard Z method. So Z, you kind of convert everything to the Z method. You look at just the risk factor on this one. You see my Z statistic is somewhere between negative infinity and 2.33. Your choice, right? So we can use either one. So the nice thing, and this is why a lot of engineers like the measurements method, because I just go, is the 78.24 I got in there in the range? Or is it not? The other one, I have to calculate the Z and say, is the Z within the range? I'll get the same answer either way. My conclusions will come out exactly the same. Just some versions, it's a lot easier to understand one versus the other. So this would be the measurements method, right? So you can see both of these are basically the same just scaled and I get the same conclusion either way so my blue line this is where my actual this is X bar in this case this is my Z statistic in this case they're both in the go ahead and keep it range right so they we say we cannot reject the hypothesis or we're stuck with it really what we do is we don't have enough evidence at that level to claim that the average corrosion rate is greater than 80 so it just didn't get a number that's big enough and both of these gave the same results so that's the one means example. Now we're gonna move on to the two means example where I'm trying to compare one to the other. So in this case, I have an aluminum tubing machine being extruded from a pair of supposedly identical machines. And you can watch a little video on aluminum tubing extraction if you wanna know that that's all about. A plant engineer, she suspects something's wrong, so she sends the technicians down to take a samples from a few days runs and compiles the following. She takes 10 samples from machine one, measures the length, measures the variance, it goes to machine two, grabs 20. I don't know, He maybe he was lazy that day. But the idea is that N1 and N2 are different. And we're going to have to deal. So we're going to have to deal with that. And I just put this one in to make it a little more complicated because this does happen a lot in reality where you just don't necessarily have the exact same amount of samples. It makes that analysis easier. So I'm going to make it a little bit harder by telling you, hey, this time the samples aren't the same size. What test are we going to use and approximately what level of evidence is there to suggest that the machines are generating different tubing? That's what we're going to try to find out. So I calculate my sample statistics. So you see I have my N1 and N2 are different. I have an X bar 1 and X bar 2. I have, look at that, I have two means. Hint, hint of what kind of test this is going to be. I have some standard deviations of each of those. I don't really care. Are the population means different? Oh, uh, that's the hypothesis. So the idea is if my null hypothesis is, is mu1 the same as mu2? And my alternative hypothesis is that they are not the same. Mutually exclusive, gonna try to knock this one down. I need to find out, do I have evidence to say that that's not true? Questions to ask, is it one mean or two? It's a two means test. It's a two tails test because I didn't say larger or bigger, larger or smaller. Nope, I just said different. And that's the key word that I was looking for. Different is giving a good indicator that this is a two tail test. So I construct the hypothesis like I just mentioned on there. The boring result is that, hey, she just sent down the technician for nothing. The population means are really the same. It's just that little difference is just statistically insignificant, right? That's where that term comes from. The amazing result is that the population means really are different and that that little anomaly there really means something. An anomaly is big enough to actually go say, well, I don't think these tubings are actually making anything. I don't think the average tubing coming out of this stuff is going to be that different. We just got a weird sample. So we're established a significant level. So we're kind of maybe potentially going to statistics hell for this one because what we're asking is she's asking us to basically determine what is the level, right? To me, this is a statistics hell event. But I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of MBA people and other people who like to do this method. And you know what? I'll see them with Justin Bieber and Miley Cyrus later. But, you know, we're going to go with it. It's your boss. We're going to do it with the significance level method. Right? It, it works enough for us that we can get away with it. Determine the applicable test statistics. Is it one means or two? It is a two means test this time. I'm comparing. And we'll find out later when we get to ANOVA how sometimes this has got some limits to it. Is the population standard deviations known? Well, not really. 
Are we assuming that they're the same? Eh, we can pretty much assume they're the same, not too worried about this one. My N is less than 30 again. I didn't do quite enough. Right, I just barely did it. I actually only did 20 on one side, 10 on the other. So I'm going to use a T test again, like we did last time, but I'm going to use T scores. I'm going to get them from the student T distribution instead of the Gaussian distribution. Because right, it's a little bit more accurate for small samples. Right, that's for n. It, that's for n is less than or equal to thirty. Gaussian distribution is for typically or greater than thirty. So I got my test statistics. The t test statistic is this. The only reason I do this is because n one does not equal n two. Otherwise, I don't have to bother with this stuff. Otherwise, just use s. Right, but the fact of the matter is, I don't necessarily have same sizes so the comp got a little bit more complicated that's why I did this example look up my criteria well because I'm using a t-table I need to know degrees of freedom and we're gonna find out what degrees of freedom are in the next couple lectures it's not really important now but right now basically it's the number of data points in both cases minus the number of means I'm testing right so then I have you know, n minus one plus n minus two, right? This is so. This is n minus one, n minus one. Add those together, the same as n one plus n two minus two. And the reason I need this is I can't look up scores on a student's table. Needs uh, the mu or the degrees of freedom. Once it gets above, once mu gets to above thirty. It's almost like it's infinity, and then you can just use the Z table instead. So I look on a table, I look up 0.1 at a degree of freedom of 29, I pull a 170 for 0.10, I pull 205 for 5, I pull a 076 for that. And what that really is, is if I look at a T distribution, looks very similar to the other one, at 10% of the population being still under here, that's at 170. Then at 5% of the population being on the, to the right of this, I get 2.05. And way over here, I get 2.76. And then at that point, I only have 1% of the population on either side. Right. So that's what I'm going to do those. So I calculated my test statistic based on my sample data. So I just calculated all those numbers. I replaced them all in there, did some calculations. You can pretty much follow along with that one at your own pace. You can pause the video here to kind of look at what's going on. I'm basically getting to the point where I'm calculating this T statistic based on my data. Measurement method doesn't really work so hot with this one. right? You want to stick with the, stick with the standard T one. So then I compare that. My 2109, that means I'm way out here. So I have my cutoffs, you know, even at 5%, I have 2.05, I'm way out here. If I go to 2.01, right, I get out here and I'm actually sitting, this value is actually sitting somewhere between 5 out of 100 and 1 out of 100. So I'm sitting somewhere between there. So I have less than a 1 in 20 chance of being wrong that I would actually pull something off of that means. Because remember, this is a distribution of means. That's a big one to always remember. It's a distribution of possible sample means if mu was equal to whatever this line is. Right? So remember, that's what it always is. Business conditions dictate whether or not you'd actually qualify that as big enough. It's less than 1 in 100, right? Less than, less than 1 in 20 chance, but more, sorry, not, not less, but more than 1 in 100. So whether or not they actually accept that, that's fine. Hopefully they would dictate that ahead of time as to what's actually considered uh, risky enough to basically go to a suit, ask for a warranty violation, whatever, prior to sending the technician, not after you actually get the data, but sometimes people cheat, and like I said, they go to statistics hell, so you know, what can you do for about it, right? 
So again, really kind of look at it, look at the mean differences. And again, one of the things I really want to reiterate again, the hardest thing about this stuff is just kind of forgetting how this works, right? So remember, I'm just going to do this again. This whole system works because of the central limit theorem, right? And the idea is that no matter what this distribution is, all over the place, this is my x, and I have a on my x. There is a there is a mean for x. But I don't know what it is. So what I do is I grab samples from this. Sample from this. I calculate an X bar and I put it on this graph. And if I were to do that a whole bunch of times, I would actually get a graph that literally looks like this. And this is my distribution of this is my distribution of data. This is my distribution of of x bars of means. And nicely because of the central limit theorem this little curve puts itself right on mu. And that's the beauty, is that it puts it right on mu no matter what this is. No matter what this looks like. So it doesn't matter what that looks like. So that's the advantage. I don't need to know what that underlying distribution is. As long as I know that if I sample it, and this is the kicker, representatively, randomly, and without bias, then I can assume that my mu, my mu, my sample I get on here should follow on this distribution. So most of the time will be right around the right answer. Every so often, I'm going to get some goofball number, and it'll be out there. So what I do with the goofball numbers is I decide that I'm going to set up some lines here and say, hey, if you get one of these ones out here, you reject the null, reject the null out here, and inside here, you go ahead and say accept it. If I get something close enough in here, I go ahead and say, that's probably what I expected. It probably is really what's going on there. Right, that's again the doubling. I'm going to reiterate this particular slide over and over and over again because it's the one of the misunderstood ideas of the central limit theorem, but it's how everything in this statistics stuff works. So you might see this kind of little discussion every single time because I really want to drive it home to really kind of make it make an impact on you. All right, so that finishes up our means testing one. A little bit longer lecture this time, but just had a couple examples. You can start and stop the lecture all you want to kind of go over those, and I'll see you next time. Thanks a lot.